All right, we are right at the start time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, so we'll go ahead and begin. First off, good afternoon. I'm Jason Thomas, Portfolio Coordinator at America Makes, and I'll be your host for today's America Makes TRX webinar series. Um, I know we still have some people logging in, so we'll get the uh, housekeeping out of the way here. A little background on the TRX webinar series before I introduce our speakers. As America Makes continues its mission to expand and accelerate the footprint of additive manufacturing and 3D printing, this medium called the America Makes Technical Review and Exchange Webinar Series was created. By creating this platform, it allows the additive manufacturing and 3D printing community to come together and share knowledge and experience with a broader community. If you or your team are interested in presenting during the TRX Webinar Series, there will be a link to complete the request form at the end of our series today, or you can reach out to uh, the America Makes TRX Webinar Series Administrator, Jason Thomas, directly. A few important notes before we kick off the series. Uh, at the end of the presentation, there will be an opportunity for a uh, question and answer. If during the presentation you have a question, please submit it in the Q&A space on your WebEx screen, and I'll ask it during the Q&A session. I will do my best to get all of your questions answered. Today's webinar excuse me, is, is on insertion loss of 3D printed selectively metallized microstrip circuits on low loss dielectric with varied surface roughness. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Colby Hobart of Fortify and Mike Benson of Avratech. With over 35 years of experience in product development and marketing electronics, Mike Vinson has been responsible for all aspects of product and process development activities and manufacturing operations. Today, Mike leads the commercialization of Avratech Precursor Catalytic Ink nanomaterials, and ink blocking materials. Prior to this, he served as program manager, products and services group at SRI International. Mike was also director of business development for semiconductor equipment, VP of sales and marketing, uh, VP of business development, manager of applied R&D for Colk and Soft Industries, manager, process engineering, assembly interconnection lab Texas, at Texas Instruments Inc., and a manager at Abacus Wire Bond Engineering. Colby is an experienced radio frequency engineer in both the design and applications engineering areas. With 18 years of experience in the field, he has held positions with several su subcontractor suppliers to the military prime contractors, performing work on various passive components for radar systems. New to the additive manufacturing market, Colby brings his breadth of experience in RF and radar to this space. His main focus in the RF applications role is to bridge the gap between the type of RF design engineer he has worked with for years and, and the enabling technology that brings relevant low loss RF materials to the additive manufacturing market. He very much enjoys the excitement of demonstrating to customers the enhanced antenna performance they can achieve through additive technology. Mike and Colby, I will now turn it over to your, you and your team. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Jason, for the introduction. Um, so thanks, everyone, for coming today to listen to our webinar. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, microstrip circuits on low-loss Rogers radix material and um, the components that Fortify has printed and had metallized by Averitech to do some studies on surface roughness and those effects. So uh, just to highlight a little bit about Fortify as a company, uh, we uh, manufacture a printer that is capable of 3D printing some highly specialized materials. And the, the printer prints, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about, but um, photo curable polymers and specializes in those, a group of those polymers that are very high in viscosity and very high in filler content. Um, the company is a full stack company. And when we say that, what we mean is not only did we develop and manufacture the printers, we also uh, develop all of the software and firmware needed to operate those printers. And we are also a material science company developing materials. In fact, um, some of the founders like to say that we were a materials company first, 
that was forced into developing a 3D printer capable of printing those materials since none existed on the market. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so one of the, a couple of the reasons this printer by Fortify is unique in what it can um, print for the, the range of for, photo curable uh, polymers. Uh, one reason, it's not on this slide, but I'll mention is the force of the Z-axis plunge with the build plate uh, can be up to 2,000 newtons. And that is important because of the very high viscosity materials that we want to print. And that is the highest force in class to thin out the material. So if you look at the print reservoir and the um, build plate above it being plunged on the Z-axis, we work with materials sometimes due to that high filler content as thick as clay and the build plate must plunge down at its eight and a half by four inch footprint and squish that material to a thickness of 75 micron. Well, really anywhere from 20 to 25 to 150 micron um, for the purpose of the Rogers Radix we'll be discussing today. It is a 75 micron build layer. So that compresses to 75 micron and then the uh, projector, UV projector flashes once and all the um, white pixels that the, on the projector at 1080p will cure and all the black pixels will not cure. And that works out to a 75 micron cubed little building block in the part that's being printed. Um, so the high force is able to compress that high viscosity material, but it also the fillers in that material are prone to settling. And most of these materials that we're working for, these really high filler content. And so every few layers that print uh, the liquid filled resin will circulate out of the print reservoir and back down into this continuous mixer, this heated continuous moving mixer down below. And that stirs up all the, the fillers that have Start well, really, they haven't started to settle yet. That's the whole point. But um, it it agitates all the fillers again to ensure that they are stirred up in the resin and that there's no settling during the print. And that guarantees a uh, homogeneous material that is cured at the time of print and also isotropic material across the dielectric, which the RF engineers and the audience will know is of very high importance for the RF materials. Uh, next slide, please. Here's a little rundown of some of these high viscosity, high filler content materials that Fortify is focused on printing today. As I mentioned, we've got that material science team constantly working on developing new materials. I think at this time next year, this slide will be a lot more busy. Um, but to talk through some of this today, uh, the first one is Radix. Um, like I said, the materials team uh, works to develop our own in-house materials, but at the same time, we are partnered with several materials companies in the industry. And one of those is Rogers. And Rogers has developed this Radix material that is the first photo curable um, polymer that has good RF characteristics uh, across the entire industry. It's, it's the only one, it's by itself in the industry at this time. And Fortify are the only company that are able to print this material. So we'll be diving in a lot deeper on Radix. We also have an ESD material. We have a couple ESD materials actually. The one shown is a uh, solid material that is capable of the highest temperatures, uh, temperature operating temperatures in the industry for a 3D printable ESD material. So that's really, really good for like a holding tray for um, ESD sensitive components to be surface mounted onto circuit boards. It can go through a eutectic uh, SMT oven and mount those components while protecting them from electroshock and damage in the future. Uh, ESD is a you know very important um, characteristic for circuit board assembly handling. And 
These trays are usually at six weeks or more lead time out in the industry. In the case of our ESD material, you can have a tray designed and print it the same day if it's fairly shallow or print it overnight if it's not. I mean, the print time for the materials listed here is around six millimeters per hour today. So that's how you figure out if it fits into a same day or overnight type of print. Um, HPA fits into the RF market as well. That's high purity alumina, 99.8% purity alumina with a, a 9.8 dielectric constant. So this is good for some of those high DK applications like dielectric resonator antennas or filter, ceramic filter resonators. Um, also could be used for lensing applications similar to the Radix uh, when you need a wider range of effective DKs. But it's also got an operating temperature of 1,750 C. So it's great for those high temperature applications like high speed projectiles and uh, space applications. Um, there's another ceramic in the hopper here, not displayed here. That's a 97% purity alumina. It's alumina silicate. Um, that is developed specifically for its low shrink capabilities. So these ceramics start as a photopolymer, heavily loaded with ceramic powder, enough polymer to print on the printer. And then they are loaded into a sintering oven that burns off all the polymer and sinters together the ceramic powder um, so that you end up with the same characteristics that you'd have out of material characteristics that you've had out of a um, machined ceramic part, but with high resolution um, features that oftentimes would be impossible to machine, kind of like the, the image shown there. Um, the TCDR material, third from the right, is a highly thermal conductivity material that can be printed with high resolution in these printers, just like the others. Uh, it's not electrically conductive. This is a material that you uh, could Submerge in a system that in this in this case, that's an example of something that maybe fluid would be passing through in a pipe and pulling um, high levels of heat out of the fluid. Uh, again, you know, something that can be designed and realized within a day. We also have a digital tooling product that's used for injection molding applications um, due to the magnetic aligning of fibers in the material. It is the highest strength uh, 3D printable injection molding tooling product on the market. So using the magnets in the printer systems, the fibers can all be aligned to give it added strength in the axis of most importance during the injection molding process. And last on the right is the uh, high temperature uh, tooling material. So this is a material that can be uh, printed for jigs and fixtures for high temperature applications. Um, so all of these materials can be printed on one printer. If you need one, if you have one printer, you can print all these materials with the flux one printer, or if you just need the RF centric materials, like the radix and the HPA, uh, that could be done on a flux core printer, which is slightly lower cost than the one with the magnets. Next, uh, next slide. Um, just a quick, uh, deep dive on the radix material itself. This is the photopolymer material developed by Rogers and printed solely by Fortify. Uh, the dielectric constant of 2.8 is uh, a nice nice number for be right in the range of a lot of circuit board materials. Um, the dissipation factor of 0043 at 10 gigahertz and 0046 is certainly the lowest loss uh, DF number. Uh, on a high resolution 3D printable material today. Um, those were measured at 10 gigahertz and 24 gigahertz respectively, the 0046. And so we expect from our knowledge of low loss materials, that if you drew a line through those two numbers on a linear uh, DF versus frequency graph, um, that you should come pretty close to extrapolating how this performs um, in E band and above. So we do get a lot of questions about how this works at the automotive 77 gigahertz range, and uh, it should be um, a linear increase using those two numbers. Um, the CTE 
of the material is 76 parts per million per degree C. So three to four times that of copper. So plated through holes are something that still need to be studied a little more in depth. Um, but the prediction is that uh, with a little bit heavier plating um, that they should do okay over a reasonable temp operating temperature range. Uh, the moisture absorption of 0.08 weight percentage gain over 24 hours is extremely low. So this is on par with uh, other Rogers uh, low loss traditional materials that you buy in sheet form. Uh, really important for RF because with moisture absorption comes a uh, very quick escalation in loss within a device. So that's a number I think everyone should pay attention to if they're looking at any other kind of 3D um, printable uh, lower loss materials. And then the decomposition temperature where it, where it um, sees 1% weight loss happens at 313C. So the operating temperature that we've been using is 250C. Uh, there's probably a little bit of room there. And then uh, outgassing, it, it passed you know, the standard ASTM test there. So next slide, please. Um, this slide shows uh, traditionally where uh, 3D printable uh, materials land uh, as far as dissipation factor and dielectric constant. Please note the dissipation factor is on a logarithmic scale. So you are escalating quickly as you travel from left to right on the graph. Uh, that's the only way we could really meaningfully fit all these materials on one plot. Um, can I get a, a next click here? And what, what we found here is that uh, the photopolymers are all over a 0.01. You draw a line down the middle of the graph and thermoplastics are what fall to the left of the 0 0.01. And that's important because I would consider left of the line uh, really about the extent of what you can call low loss. And the uh, left of the line is all thermoplastics uh, prior to the introduction of Rogers Radix. And what that means is uh, low resolution 3D printing. So there's not much you can do with uh, fine shapes and the thermoplastics. They're nice materials in sheet form um, and they are 3D printable to uh, low resolution shapes. The photopolymers on the other hand have been uh, high loss traditionally. And then if we get another click here, we can see where the radix falls and uh, very low loss for a photopolymer. Uh, actually the lowest loss material on this chart outperforming uh, the thermoplastics. And this is you know, due to Rogers Corporation and their uh, very in-depth knowledge of low loss materials dating back, you know, way back a uh, number of years. They've been the industry leader in low loss materials in the traditional format, which is gonna be uh, a thin sheet of material, um, typically copper clad and processed by a circuit board house. And they have come up with this formulation that is uh, photo curable, which makes it 3D printable, but only on the Fortify machine. Uh, next slide. Um, just talking real quick about insertion loss. Uh, insertion loss is when you excite a device, you can look at it as a black box uh, with power over a range of frequencies. Um, insertion loss is what's reported back as um, the how much power got through the device and out the other side. And there's four components to that insertion loss. There's uh, reflection loss, which is really return loss. So whatever amount of power was reflected back at you due to geometry changes and impedance changes in the device. Um, radiation loss, which is whatever amount of power can radiate out of the device. It doesn't happen much in waveguide or strip line, but in microstrip, there's some radiation loss. And in other devices, there would be radiation loss. I mean, that's the goal of an antenna, but that's not what we're talking about here. Um, dielectric loss is that DF number we talked about on the radix. You know, very critical to have low dielectric loss and keep the percentage of dielectric loss well below the percentage of metal loss. That's how you, you know you have a low loss dielectric. If dielectric loss starts to exceed that of the metal loss, 
then your system is just going to be high loss in general. Um, and then ohmic loss, that's the loss in the conductor um, as it is applied to the dielectric. And that's very important. Um, if we're going to go after a low loss dielectric and advertise that, we better not be losing a whole bunch of power in our conductor. And you'll see uh, a lot of 3D printable devices with silver ink uh, printed on them in different methods, uh, whether it's inkjet or aerosol jet or dispensed from a syringe. And that silver ink, even when uh, sintered by high temperatures, rare, rarely achieves much over 40% of bulk conductivity of silver. So those lines are very lossy. And the goal here at Fortify is to work with people like a Veritech who are putting down high conductivity metals. So they'll get into that later, why, why their metals are high conductivity and low in loss. Next slide, please. Next slide. So uh, just a quick look at a cartoon of surface roughness. Uh, there's two important factors in surface roughness. A lot of times the companies working with the vendor foil are going to advertise a roughness number like RA or um, average roughness uh, of a material. But it's also important to put out uh, that the periodicity of that roughness is important as well. So uh, when your peaks and valleys are very close together, you will have lower, a higher loss than when they are stretched out. And we'll talk about that more later as well. So next slide. And the experiment designed here is uh, a series of microstrips. That, so we printed at Fortify with a, a 750 micron thick dielectric. The way these are printed all standing up on end, um, that is the thinnest nominal value we were comfortable with at the time of this print. We're always striving for um, thinner, but we use a 750 micron um, stage and we printed pairs of microstrips that are 800 millimeters and I mean, 200 millimeters and 50 millimeters long. So that's an eight inch and a two inch line. And later we'll report loss per inch based on that. So what we did here was we printed a number of different orientations. There are a couple that are flat to the build plate that aren't shown, but if you just kind of, you see the ones that are laying down the long way, if those were tipped on their side, that would be flat to the build plate or up on supports hovering above the build plate in the same orientation. And then perpendicular to the build plate, we did a number of different angles to kind of stretch out the periodicity of the layer lines. So there are some at 90 degrees and some at zero degrees and several angles in between here. If you look close, those long triangles are really just an angle of that, you know, five inch, five eighths inch wide microstrip uh, being held up by a long series of supports. Uh, next slide. So, um, like to turn it over to Mike at Averitech now, and he's going to talk about how they went about metallizing these uh, microstrip structures and some characteristics of those metals that they use. This is Mike Vincent at Averitech. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Next slide. Averitech uh, has been in business for about 15 years now, and our business is advanced manufacturing processes and chemistries. Uh, we've mainly focused on PCBs, uh, ultra high density and high performance printed circuit boards, as well as packaged substrates. The other areas that we've been working on more recently though, include RS, RF passives, which are antennas and waveguides in our case. We're doing some thermal structures for heat pipes and vapor chambers, as well as uh, heterogeneous modules for uh, heat transfer. And then we're working on 3D printed objects with Fortify and others. Next slide. Veritech is one of SRI International spinouts. So we're in good company here. We have uh, companies like Intuitive Surgical, uh, Siri, which was a company before it was acquired by Apple and became the well-known voice uh, engine that's in, in the Apple devices. Um, and many others here that have been developed. In the uh, materials in, um, area though, uh, Veritech is one of the principal uh, spin outs there at, at uh, SRI. 
Thank you. Next slide, please. So here we have an example. We have a uh, video here of uh, how we're patterned onto an antenna, which was a cylinder. Um, this was for a GPS antenna. This was our first attempt at 3D patterning. So you can see the laser uh, drawing the pattern into the catalyst. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. And then once we have the catalyst cured, we can then uh, plate up with the electrolyst copper and then the electrolytic copper to perform the circuit. Next slide, please. So for the three-dimensional uh, additive electronics, we would first start off with dipping the part into our uh, LMI ink. That's our proprietary uh, material that we've developed. We dry the solvent from the ink at, at a low temperature, and then we selectively cure the ink with the CO2 laser at low power, which was the video that you saw before where it's curing only in the areas where the laser strikes the surface. After that, we remove the uncured portion. And LMI is a good uh, ink for this because it is uniquely cured by heat. After that, we plate with the electrolysts and we plate with the electrolytic. In the case of the ceramic that we saw earlier, we cut that to length and we make electrical connections with solder for testing. Next slide, please. So our enabling chemistry here is the LMI liquid metal ink. Next slide. So our liquid metal ink is, is very unique in the industry. It's a, a solvent-based ink. It's non-aqueous. That enables a lot of things uh, for low-cost manufacturing and additive manufacturing. It'll conform to any 3D surface on a nanometer scale. So this ink, if it's poured into a ceramic or uh, coated onto a ceramic, it will penetrate all of the pores in there. Uh, we've worked with things like catalytic converters, where deep down inside the converter, uh, there are a lot of pores. We found after doing cross-sectioning that the palladium was uh, deposited on all surfaces and areas in there. At the end, after it's cured, it's very dense. It's a fully packed atomic film. And it's also very, very thin. It's only a few nanometers thick. The LMI can be formulated for different metals and their alloys. Primarily, though, for this, we're using palladium, which is acting as a catalyst for the electrolyst plating of other metals. Next slide. So a demonstration of that is we have uh, the standard process for depositing a catalyst and then plating up with electrolysis is on the left. We can see that the catalyst is not very dense. It's uh, larger particles. They're usually deposited in an aqueous fashion, put down with uh, some liquid and then uh, developed there. And then the electrolysis, when it plates up, it's not very dense at the beginning. With the Veritec, you can see at the upper right-hand corner, that's a uh, TEM. And the thickness of that is around the order of magnitude of five nanometers thick. It's in silicon. Uh, it's being put on top of silicon at this, uh, on that one, and then um, cross section so that we can see the thickness of the plating itself. When we do that, we get a very dense and thin coating of copper that we can electrolytically plate on top of that. Other metals as well can be electrolytically deposited, but copper is the most popular right now. Um, and that's very dense so that with only one or 200 nanometers thick of copper, we then form um, a cathode that allows us to plate up, electroplate up uh, thicker layers of copper with electroplating. Next slide, please. The other key part of this equation is the, the laser that we're using. We chose a Keyence laser. It uh, is designed and developed for patterning on 3D objects. It was originally developed for scribing um, logos and such on various objects for manufacturers. Uh, it'll handle almost any 3D object we put in there. Its surface uh, topography is defined by the SDI file that we submit to it. So we could have a cone or a hemisphere or parabolic shape, 
um, a double saddle shape, a number of different shapes that we could use to create a, um, a pattern on them with the 3D uh, lazy capability. It does this by adjusting the, the focal the point of the laser up and down, and it has a fairly large envelope that we can work with. Next slide, please. So this is an example of patterning on to a plastic material. This is a molded plastic that Rogers has developed. Um, to do it all the way around the part, we need to index it because the laser is a line of sight tool. So when we've patterned it in one area, then we turn it around and then pattern the next adjacent area. As long as we carefully align these parts, it's very repeatable and very reproducible. Uh, and the parts you see on the right hand side are the ones that we've electrolysly and then electroplated uh, with uh, on top of the fully cured catalyst. Um, it's, it's important to note that this is fully additive. There's no of the none of these metals are removed uh, after they've been cured and plated. So uh, there's not like a foil on top of this that we began with. Also, it's in this case, it's directly deposited on the TMM material. There's no adhesive layer or any other layer that needs to be uh, deposited before putting the metal on. Next slide, please. So with Rogers Radex, we've done the same process on the Radex with slightly different parameters. But again, we've deposited the metal directly on the Radex material without using any kind of adhesive layer or tie layer underneath the metal, the metal strips. This pattern was developed so that we could test the adhesion on the radix. Next slide, please. So when we look at a cross section, one of the things we're gonna be talking about today is the roughness of the material. The roughness of the copper is directly related to uh, the roughness of the substrate. So if we have um, a, an RA of six on the substrate, the bottom surface of the copper will also be a six. The bigger peaks are reflected on the top surface of the copper because it gets some smoothing and filling. We can enhance the smoothing and filling further if we want to uh, with changing pr plating parameters. But what you're seeing here is pretty typical for uh, 40 micron thick copper on radix. You can also see in the radix sample here that it was printed in a 90 degree format. So you can see the layers running up and down here so that uh, it was basically turned on its side to do the patterning and printing. Next slide, please. So the materials that we've evaluated with this 3D printing so far are uh, the Fortify materials, the Radex, the HPA, and we're also looking in the future at digital tooling material. Uh, the molded or cast or machine 3D objects that we've worked with are the Rogers TMM, like the white cones that you saw before. The alumina ceramic, which was uh, the ceramic rod that you saw, and uh, we're working right now with ceramic composite. It's important to note that the HPA and the alumina ceramic process almost identically uh, with the laser process. The plated metals that we're working with right now primarily are copper, uh, palladium, and platinum in the electrolyst category. So that's the very thin 200 nanometer layer that we're putting down first. And then the electrolytic metals that will plate up to uh, the thickness of the trace that we need are the copper, the platinum, and the gold. Um, there are other metals that can be electrolytically plated and electrolytically plated, and we're compatible with most of those, but these are the ones that we're working on right now. Next slide, please. All right, um, this is Colby. I'm going to be uh, taken back over here to uh, discuss the rest of the experiment um, after we got the parts back from Mike and his team over at Averitech. Um, really nice looking copper on the parts. So what we did next over at Fortify is we used our laser profilometry tool. It's a Kientz uh, one-shot 3D VR is the name of the tool. 
And what that does, it, it allows us to measure um, in a bunch of different ways, uh, surface roughness of components. Um, so I moved over from the signal trace slightly over onto the dielectric. And I took surface roughness measurements of the dielectric on every variant of uh, microstrip pairs that we had printed and had metallized by Veritech. Um, I opted to measure uh, one by one centimeter squares and take a full um, profile of that area just because some of the patterning and the roughness didn't seem to vary along a line as much as in an area. And I wanted to capture uh, a, a true average of roughness. So what I did is I took three places per sample and measured um, these size swatches. And then I took the average of the three squares and that's what is reported here in the uh, chart to the right. So as far as samples that were printed with the broad wall parallel to the build plate, I had one where uh, the signal was facing the film. Um, so that gave a real smooth, the smoothest possible surface finish coming off the Fortify printer without post-processing polishing or anything like that. There was none of that post-processing in this experiment. I had another where the signal fa was facing the film, but the um, uh, microstrip slab was suspended on what we call supports. Supports are these little, well, you saw them in a picture earlier, but they're these little um, cylindrical beams coming up from the build plate, from a little raft on the build plate, suspending the microstrip above the build plate. What's nice about the supports is that they, they help guarantee um, uniform thickness of the part if it's being built against the build plate or, or parallel to the build plate because there is some self-leveling, very small amount of self-leveling leveling that happens between the build plate and the reservoir or the film. Um, however, there's a downside to printing on supports, and that is that uh, as you remove the supports, uh, you have to sand them flush to get a really uniform surface there. Uh, I opted not to sand them, and so I just we printed the ground copper over uh, a surface that looks kind of like a Lego, um, you know, but the bumps are are pretty close to the surface of the slab. So maybe these little like 100 micron bumps that provides a little bit harder to anticipate impedance there. Um, and then we did one where the signal was facing the build plate and we have multiple build plates in house. We opted to use uh, the rougher, more standard build plate. And that one shows a 9.2 micron RA, whereas the film facing ones show about a one micron RA. Now, when we go perpendicular um, to the build plate and, pl and print at various angles, remember we're printing at 75 micron layers. So uh, the more we tilt the sample, the more kind of stretched out the distance between layers is. Um, and at a zero degree print, the layers are stacked um, from left to right across the transmission line. And at a 90 degree print, the layers are stacked uh, 75 microns apart running up the transmission line. So this is the best way for us to just organically create different surface roughnesses with different periodicities coming off the printer. Um, we could have done some things to artificially create different surface roughnesses. But the point of the experiment was to look at roughnesses as printed. So what customers can expect when they're printing parts. And uh, on the perpendicular samples, um, we ranged from 2.8 micron to 5.3 micron uh, average RA. And that kind of increases as the um, build angle increases from left to right. There's a little glitch in that line there. 40 to 70, but um, for the most part, um, that increases over time. That's probably just our ability to measure these surface references accurately. Um, next slide, please. 
Oh, one back. I'm sorry. Just looking at the pictures here, that's a picture coming off of the laser profilometer. And you can see how smooth that looks uh, for the film side at the 0.9 RA and versus the build plate side at the 9.2 RA. Thanks. Next slide. Um, took all these samples after the profilometry uh, down to Rogers, who um, graciously agreed to run some measurements for us in their uh, nice intercontinental microwave W7000 fixture. And this is a fixture that is built to measure microstrips of various kinds. It's a pretty flexible fixture, which is really nice. Uh, it drops a little probe down onto the ground and it's got some surround ground either underneath for standard microstrip or uh, on top for like a coplanar waveguide launch style microstrip. Uh, handles both and handles it very well. So um, the system is calibrated uh, as you typically would for a network analyzer from the ends of the SMAs to each other. Actually, in this case, this was a, uh, a 2.4 millimeter connection. This can actually measure up higher in frequency than our microstrips were designed for. Um, and then the fixture becomes part of the measurement. So that's the whole point of this eight inch and two inch uh, lines so that we can measure an eight inch line, measure a two inch line, um, two inches, you know, long enough to give us good propagation coming out of the fixture. Let that wave kind of smooth out before it goes back into the fixture um, so that we don't have any weird resonances there. And then essentially we subtract the insertion loss in dB of the two inch line from the eight inch line and divide by six. And we have a loss per inch metric um per a given print orientation so two inch and eight inch line for every orientation were measured using this fixture um next slide so we'll just talk about results here i separated the parallel to build plate varieties from the perpendicular to build plate varieties i guess a little trade-off there in whether to separate them from the other but um <clears throat> what we see here on the uh, green line uh, was using Rogers loss prediction software, which they've proven out over time to be very accurate. Uh, we plugged in a 2.8 DK and a loss tangent of 004. Um, slight miscommunication when we were doing this simulation. Um, it should have been a 0043 we plugged in. We, we used 004 and uh, perfectly smooth copper. So some ideal, perfectly smooth, um, no roughness copper. And that presents itself in the green line here. And then with the other lines here, we see the parallel to build plate. Um, Ports sample, which I said had that kind of uh, Lego shaped backplane, uh, kind of hard to predict. Uh, it's actually a constantly changing um, impedance along the line uh, to a small amount. It actually performed pretty well. But um, I think the important part of this output chart here is to separate the, the red line there, ignore the red line. And we're looking at the very smoothest sample we, we could print and the very roughest sample we could print. And this is the most important result is that those two are, I would say exactly overlaying through 10 gigahertz. And then you can see that the uh, smoother result actually becomes slightly more lossy than the rougher result, uh, which is odd and could probably attribute to um, measurement error or slash noise in the system there. As you go higher in frequency, it's higher to measure this thing. But exactly the same through 10 gigahertz. Um, and if, if the rougher one had taken off as more lossy, then I would say, um, you know, probably the roughness is affecting that loss tangent, but uh, that loss measurement. But really, um, we're looking at the same result. And that's very surprising, right? I mean, a 0.9, micron RA and a 9.2 micron RA on vendor foil. If we were printing and etching these in a board shop and the vendor 
foil showed up with those measurements, we would expect uh, quite a bit more loss, definitely discernible on this plot. Um, but we don't see that. And what that says is that the periodicity of the roughness coming off the Fortify printer is wide enough so that the roughness difference um, does not make a difference in loss. So that's, that's very important. So if you're looking at a part printed by Fortify and the copper looks rough, the fact that those peaks and valleys are so stretched out compared to what you'd find on a treated vendor foil um, is essentially telling you not to have a concern over that. And very excited about this result shown on the slide. Um, next slide, please. Again, um, so this slide deals with all those perpendicular varieties. We printed uh, five varieties here, and this time the M Rogers MWI um, approximation simulation, which should be very accurate for a perfectly smooth copper, is shown in red, and the rest are very tightly grouped. We've got one uh, outlier, which uh, is the smoothest copper that we had um, and it's showing it, you know, far less lossy than the others. Uh, I'm gonna say definitely a measurement error there uh, based on the previous slide and this slide being tightly grouped on all the other roughnesses. There's something going on with that outlier, but I wanted to include it because it is data and we should address that. Um, so again, we're looking at, you know, slightly less lossy than an ideal case of perfectly smooth copper on a comparable dielectric. At 10 gigahertz, you're looking at slightly better than um, a quarter of a dB per inch, which is a very respectable number. And this is showing that when we take Rogers low loss dielectric, they work so hard to create this 3D printable low loss dielectric, and we pair that with Fortify's um, roughness coming off the printer, and a Veritex metallization process for that high conductivity copper that really saves the day for uh, showing off this low loss dielectric. We've got a very respectable device as in total loss on a microstrip. So uh, the low loss dielectric is absolutely not going to waste. Um, the other two components of the periodicity of our roughness at Fortify and that high conductivity copper from Veritex are the other two pieces in this puzzle, it all comes together as a three-part system, and we've got some real low-loss RF devices here. I think that's all, right? All right. Excuse me. Thank you, gentlemen. That was a great presentation. I will now head into the Q&A session. If you do have questions for our presenters and you have not done so already, please go ahead and type them into the Q&A space. I have a couple of questions here to get started with. Um, so how thick can you make the metal on these parts? That's a good question. These are fully additive metals so that we can plate them up to whatever thickness the customer would like. Uh, because they're fully additive, uh, it, we can't get very high aspect ratios, but we can get uh, decent aspect ratios so that the height to the width is relatively good. But uh, typically we played up around 30 microns or one ounce copper in, in that range. Uh, half ounce, quarter ounce are doable, but we can also do extremely thin metals such as 100 or 200 nanometers when those kind of resistances in the metals are sought. Okay, I was just going to ask you about the thin walls. I think that's a, a lot of people are very interested in that in that area today. Um, let's see. So another question, how large of a part can you handle? So I think the, uh, as Kobe mentioned, their uh, plate was four inches by eight inches. Is that right, Kobe? Yeah, four and a half, but yeah. Okay, and uh, for the laser that we're using right now, it has a four inch by four inch by uh, one and a half inch working envelope. So the Z axis is one and a half inch. So that, that kind of defines what we're working with today. We can take larger parts and do a type of 5D process where we're actually moving the part underneath the laser and then moving to different areas and work with the larger part. And also, uh, 
CANS makes larger area lasers that we can work with uh, to make larger parts. Okay, great. And uh, so how would the results change for different dielectric thicknesses? That's a very good question. I'll take that one. Um, so essentially, the thicker the dielectric that we print, uh, the lower the frequency range we're able to measure over is one aspect, but also the thicker dielectric uh, that is printed, um, the lower the percentage of total loss that's attributed to that ohmic or metallic loss that I presented on an earlier slide. So uh, I would consider 750 micron slabs, which are uh, 30 mil um, for the A and D people um, to be somewhat middle ground as far as what people are using for microstrip lines today. There's a lot of stuff on 60 mil or even um, double that. Uh, but there's also some you know, very thin microstrips for um, form fitting purposes. Really, the microstrip designer is probably going to use uh, as thick as they can for that application for routing and um, fitting in the thickness box uh, because of that fact that the metal losses really dive the thicker you go. So if your goal, though, was to really characterize and make um, the difference in metal roughness as inward facing toward the ground um, really stand out, you would want to develop on the thinnest dielectric you could. And also that would allow you to characterize up to higher frequencies. So we noticed during testing that our uh, frequency um, limitation for the measurements, it got noisy between 10 and 20 uh, gigahertz, but above 20 gigahertz, um, there was some moding there. And that, uh, that kind of made the results above 20 um, not very valid. And so a thinner dielectric would allow us or a microstrip designer to go up higher in frequency, uh, which could be important. But also, I wanted to print on as thin of a dielectric as I could um, in order to really make those results of different roughnesses stand out against each other. And we were only comfortable today printing with those big, long structures standing off the build plate at about 750 micron. Um, I would be interested in repeating the experiment sometime at say uh 20 mil or 10 mil like a 250 micron that would be that would be excellent that would really make the results uh contrast however um given that chart that we showed with the roughest sample and the thinnest sample um exactly on top of each other through 10 gigahertz uh i'm quite confident that going thinner um will prove the same um, that our periodicity and our roughness uh, makes it such that um, going rough has essentially no effect on the insertion loss of the system. All right, great answer. Thank you, Colby. All right, so I think that's all the questions that we have for today. Uh, so that's going to wrap today's TRX webinar. I just want to uh, once again thank Mike and Colby and the, and the whole team. Uh, this has been a been great working with you guys. I think it was a great webinar. Um, you know, if any of our our uh, attendees have further questions for the presenters, um, you can reach out to them directly. We have their contact information here on the screen. And uh, just another reminder: if you think you or your organization is interested in sharing on the TRX webinar series, you can fill out the form that uh, is going to follow the presentation. Or you can reach out to myself, Jason Thomas at jason.thomas at ncdmm.org. Thanks again, everyone, and have a great day. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Thank Mike. you, Jason. Thanks, Colby.